Okay, this week I'm joined by John Kampfner, uh, who's got quite the CV. Um, former chief political correspondent at the Financial Times. He's the former editor of the New Statesman from 2005 to 2008. Uh, he's a regular writer for the Times, the Guardian, and the New European. Uh, and he's the Sunday Times bestseller of Why the Germans Do It Better, which is here. Um, I think a good place to start, John, would be, where did you write this book? Hi there. I, I suppose it's unfinished business. I had been a correspondent in my 20s in Germany, in Bonn, the old sleepy capital in the 80s. And then I was sent to East Berlin by the Daily Telegraph to be its uh, first correspondent to the German Democratic Republic. And I ended up pretty quickly being its last as well. Uh, I had the fortune to see all the events around the system unraveling the fall of the wall and unification. From then I was sent to Moscow and I equally saw another system collapse and another country change its form. Uh, and then I came back to Britain to do British politics and other things. So I suppose in the intervening years, there was a sense of unfinished business of revisiting the place to see how I felt about it then and how it compared to now. I always had a sneaking admiration for the place, which sat uneasily with the sort of instinctive boorish British anti-German stuff, certainly the stuff that was around when I was growing up about a thousand years ago, um, when, you know, just the whole sort of uh, anti-German stuff was pretty much accepted as being quite normal. And when I went there first time, I just found it far more intriguing. And in fact, I found the small things in German life far more difficult to deal with than the big things. Um, so you cover a, a number of issues in the book, the politics, the economics, the, the, sort of the social history of Germany in the, in the post-war years. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the things that makes German politics in the post well, yes, what it is, is its stability. And if you compare it to, to France or, or Italy, um, the, the CDU has been a, a hegemonic force, whereas in France, uh, there's been a lot more diversity in the, in, the, in the party formation. Italy's currently, of course, um, uh, constituting its uh, 69th government since the Second World War, remarkably. Um, what do you think explains the, the, the stability of the party system in Germany in the post-war years? Yeah, you um, didn't mention Rand, uh, con more contemporous, uh, contemporaneously Angela Merkel, who is still there after 16 years. Uh, she's now into her fifth British prime minister and uh, she's pretty much outsmarted all of them. I would say I put down the stability to a number of things. First of all, the historical legacy, the never again, never again will Germany allow itself to succumb to the forces of extremism or demagogy or even allow power to be concentrated in the hands of, of one person or one political party. That led, so that sort of philosophical or existential underpinning um, found form in the constitution, the basic law of 1949, which was supposed to be temporary pending eventual reunification, although nobody believed that would happen. Um, and then when unification happened in 1990, it was simply made permanent rather than anything significantly change. So you have the remembrance of history and you have structures. And I think most of all, it's a, an issue of behavior. It's about being serious. It's about being grown up. It's about not treating politics as a form of sport or entertainment, which in the case of Britain in particular, United States and other countries where there is a straightforward binary choice and where so much is supposed to revolve around the charisma of the leader, you couldn't have a greater juxtaposition between that and the German system. 
Uh, I'd be interested to get your opinions on um, how you think German nationalism has adapted since since the Second World War. Germany, of course, um, famous, well, and un, infamous for articulating and practicing forms of nationalism. You've got, you know, Herder in, in, in the in the nineteenth century articulating the the, the culture nation, um, but also the negative practice of nationalism in in, in the form of Nazism. Um, I, I don't know if you saw on Twitter, but it's it's this debate's emerging in in Britain again with with Keir Starmer's um, kind of bringing out the the flag again. Um, I don't know if you saw the video of Angela Merkel. I think it's from 2015 at a I think it's a CDU conference, and someone's waving the German flag, and she snatches it out of his hand and and takes it off. Um, I, I I was I, I'd like to get your your views on on how you think German German nationalism has has adapted in the post-war years? I mean, nationalism, the word nationalism is an absolute taboo. Patriotism was a taboo, has become much less of a taboo over time. A term I was referencing just now, the Grundgesetz, the basic law, that became almost a manifestation, the first allowable manifestation of patriotism. Uh, around the time before unification, really from the 80s onwards, the uh, more popular or populist uh, manifestation of patriotism really came with the 2006 hosting of the World Cup, the Football World Cup in Germany, where they hosted it really, really well. Um, all these open air beer gardens and uh, everybody from all different nationalities and continents all hanging out and drinking beer and waving flags. And people uh, could see for the first time that actually waving a flag wasn't necessarily a, uh, a threatening thing. It was something that people could do relatively innocently or proudly without uh, feeling the need to apologise for it. That's really where we still are. Um, the, it often gets stretched. The whole phenomenon of the AFD, the far right party, absolutely is stretching it. It's also a question around what defines a nation, what defines Germany, what defines Germanness. And in terms of citizenship, prior to reforms that took place in 2000, Germanness was actually an issue of blood. It was, you are a German, irrespective of where you lived, if you came from German stock. Now that all changed. German, Germany now, from a very slow start, has become quite a, uh, a uh, pronounced multicultural society with all that that entails, including tensions. But it has absolutely changed that sense of pride and, you know, I confronted this with my book, um, Headlong, a title, which Why the Germans Do It Better, absolutely freaked Germans out. And as I said in the introduction of my book, whenever by way of introduction in a meeting uh, or a conversation with a German, it could have been somebody I knew before or somebody I'd been uh, a more formal meeting, and I would set out what I was trying to do with the book. And to a man and woman, each person freaked out. They just could not handle the idea that you could write a book praising Germany in this way and praising it in a relative way as well by saying it is doing better, which was deliberately reductive, but you have to do that with titles of books in order for them to sell. And one person even said to me, I didn't realize that you're a right wing nationalist. To which I responded, well, nor did I, and, and nor am I. And I'm emphatically, or at least I don't think I am, that's absolutely not what I am. And your response to the way I'm trying to do this book is actually a problem. Because it is, in one respect, endearing that, and necessary, that Germans are bewildered or discombobulated by the notions of them doing things well. I mean, they make cars well and they engineer things well and they score penalties in football and all that kind of thing. That stuff is all the cliche. But actually, as a society, from bottom up, um, that they are a good society, 
uh, does worry them because they do not like that kind of unbridled enthusiasm. And in some ways that's given them a comfort blanket which has allowed them not to confront some of the shades of gray in society. It allows them as a country not really to put their head above the parapet in some of the big, dirty, difficult international in, uh, issues of the moment, falling back on the Americans and others to do their work for them. And it is really a, a pivotal moment for Germany. Will it step up? And that is part of the agenda of why I, I wrote the book. And underpinning that has to be a sense of pride, quiet pride. Now that is completely different to what I call the ridiculous rule Britanniaism of Britain, in which people wave their silly plastic flags at the last night of the proms and wear silly clothes and all, all that sort of stuff, which I just find embarrassing. It's balm to um, cover over the sores of the present and the concerns we have about the future are um, desperation to look back at past glories and to cling to them as if they represent the present, which they clearly don't. Uh, and you mentioned the, the, the threat of the AFD there. I'd like to get into that a little bit more. Um, of course, 2017 was a, a major shock to the German system with the AFD gaining 94 seats, I believe. Um, how serious a, th a threat to German democracy do you feel the, um, the alternative for Deutschland is? Uh, very serious. I am quietly confident that they've peaked, that while they remain very serious, particularly in the lands of the East, the former communist regions, they, they're still pretty uh, powerful as well in the West. But the fact that they had nothing meaningful to say or to contribute during the COVID crisis, apart from COVID denial and anti-vaccine nonsense and all these sorts of knee-jerk responses that they were not seen to be able or even interested in going into detail and helping to solve the incredibly difficult problems that underpinned people's lives has given me hope that people are moving back towards the more established parties, which isn't to sort of praise stasis or anything else. There is a considerable amount of um, atrophy in mainstream politics. And that's why the steady and pretty impressive rise of the Greens to now quite clearly second place in all opinion polls, suggesting that it's almost inevitable that the Greens will be pivotal in the next government to be formed after the elections at the end of September, either most likely with the CDU, uh, with Merkel's party and her successor, or in a red, red, green, as they call it, um, a coalition in which they would be the leading force with the Social Democrats and Die Linke, the left party. Um, either way, the Greens are absolutely front and center, which is really exciting. Um, it's exciting in terms of politics generally and politics around Europe. Um, there's no such equivalent. They are in power uh, in, in uh, junior coalition with uh, in Austria and in uh, other countries too. But in a major country, this would be the first time uh, they, they were in power in Germany in the late 90s with the Social Democrats. But this really would be a new start for green politics generally. So that would be incredibly exciting. But the AFD is co continues uh, well into double digit figures in every land, in every region of Germany. I hope that over time they will atrophy, but at the same time with the deep recession that is going to afflict not just Germany, but all Western and other countries in the long haul out of the uh, COVID crisis economically, that also opens the door to yet more populism, not just in Germany, but around the world. Yeah, I think that's right. But in, in, in of course, the United States, um, well, centrism has returned and populism has departed. Um, 
I know well, I would dispute that. I really, really would. I mean, Biden, Biden-esque centrism absolutely um, has won, and Biden, because of voter turnout, has won the biggest single individual mandate. But Trump won the second largest individual mandate. Uh, more than 70 million Americans voted for Trump. He himself, I think, because of the Capitol Hill events, won't be coming back, even um, whatever happens with impeachment. I do think he's a busted flush. And I do think, paradoxically, what happened on Capitol Hill was a good thing uh, in the round, uh, leaving aside the uh, particular victims, because it showed Trump for what he was, which wasn't just a bit of a sort of bit of a laugh, but a very, very dangerous fascist leader um, threatening democracy from its heart. And that should be a salutary warning. But my fear is that the Republicans will regather, again, the recession and the problems, um, which won't be sugar-coated with lies on Twitter and everything else will be dealt with in a more mature way. Um, but people will be susceptible in 2024 to another demagogue. And if that demagogue is at least as right-wing as Trump, but cleverer than Trump, which isn't difficult, then I think the danger will be at least as great, if not greater than before. And the, the reason I mentioned Trump was, uh, was to, to talk about um, relations between Germany and the US, which are, uh, in some, according to some survey polls, uh, an all-time low. Um, to what extent is that attributable to, to Trump and, and what, to what extent is it due to a much larger, much longer history? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. It's a fascinating area of international politics. German-American relations are incredibly emotional. They are subject to extraordinary highs and extraordinary lows. America rebuilt Germany after the war. I mean, the Brits played a role, the French in a small way played a role, but it was America. America saved Berlin with the Berlin blockade and the airlift. America, uh, with the Marshall Plan, gave the country the money to rebuild without which who knows uh, what would have happened. But more than that, America gave Germany back a sense of well-being. It gave Germany a new cultural um, reference point. Hollywood movies and uh, all manifestations of Americana in the 50s, 60s, 70s um, and onwards. Were, were vital for Germany. It often, Germany, often German towns and cities, particularly those that were directly occupied by the Americans, such as Munich and uh, in the South, feel quite American. I've always felt there's a, there's a bit of Germany that feels very American. And so you had some American presidents who were sort of Mandela-esque in their uh, adoration and and... Uh, worship, John F. Kennedy speaking famously in Berlin, um, Barack Obama almost to the same extent when he went to Germany as well. But you've also had periods of fury and bad relations, Ronald Reagan and the uh, Pershing missiles. You had George Bush and the Iraq war. But none of all of these paled into insignificance compared to um, to Trump, who loathed Merkel. I can't think of another verb. He absolutely loathed her. He disparaged her at every opportunity in public. Her body language, she's wonderful when you watch her um, on any video. She expresses everything just through her body language, her distaste for people. You just see her body withering up whenever she went near to Trump. Similarly, but in a different way with Putin, you could tell she didn't have much time for Boris Johnson. Uh, she's a woman of clearly of good taste. And um, that sense of, it's not aloofness, it's almost visceral, but at the same time, she's highly trained not to say more than she needs to. 
So, and Trump loathed that because he doesn't like being anything but the top dog. He couldn't stand the German way of doing things. He liked big, brash ball strokes. Macron in France tried to suck up to Trump by sort of becoming um, a French version of Trump, certainly in his, in the way he was demonstrative in his politics. And that worked for about five minutes before Trump also decided to go after him. But nobody has gone after anybody, I think, in modern politics as much as Trump after Merkel. I'm sure some of it could be put down to misogyny, but a lot of it was just simply, I cannot think of a political culture in a leader, uh, in two leaders, as much as at variance as, as between those two. And uh, you mentioned Putin there, which you talk about quite a lot in the book. Um, Putin famously, of course, at the Black Sea palace uh, fu fully mm -hmm. well knowing that uh, Angela Merkel was not a big fan of dogs uh, invited his his Labrador in there I believe yeah, wasn't that's it? right um, yeah um, uh, obviously uh, there's new strains in Russia German relations with the the Navalny episode at the moment um, what 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 are German uh, and Russian relations like right now are they at an all-time low would you say this area, apart from Germans um, refusing to cross traffic lights at, uh, when there's a red man and a few other things like that, German bureaucracy uh, and a few other things, this aspect of German life and German politics annoys me, infuriates me more than anything else, which is the historic tendency to go soft on Russia. Um, which is very different to be going soft on Russians, going soft on the Kremlin and on the system. It derives from historic war guilt and German war crimes on the Eastern Front were in volume and in scale, in depth, far, far more hideous than anything they did on the Western Front. It was ethnic cleansing, it was barbarism, it was butchery, it was ethnically based, and it was horrific. And the German, uh, German war guilt, number one, of course, is the Holocaust. Number two is what they did to the Russians. And that really does, and in a way, Brits and particularly in French don't really quite understand that. And that does underpin so much. That said, the willingness to kowtow to Putin, to try and ingratiate themselves to Putin, uh, and Merkel's predecessor, Gerhard Schröder, who basically was stitching up a job running Putin's oil and gas industry while he was still German chancellor, is one of the most shocking abrogations of uh, politics and morals I can Imagine when I say that to Germans quite often, they just sort of shrug their shoulders and think I'm being a bit extreme. But I just still don't quite understand it. And Merkel, to her credit, has been tough on Russia when Putin invaded Eastern or fomented the invasion of Eastern Ukraine, shot down uh, the airliner and um, annexed Crimea around 2014, 2015. She pushed through sanctions through the EU. She didn't just agree to them, she actually pushed them through and she toughened them yet and she hasn't allowed the EU to let go. That is very much to her credit. She has no time for Putin. She came from the GDR. She knows what Russian occupation uh, and Russian domination is all about. But I've been disappointed that, and they were amazing in terms of going and uh, extracting Navalny from Siberia, where not only did they try to poison him, but they tried to detain him in hospital until he died. They got him out. They took him to the Charité in Berlin, from where he recovered, and now he's back in Russia in prison, and we'll see what happens from there. So again, that's another great heroic story. But after that, they have not tightened, they have not done anything on sanctions, which I find bewildering, to say the least. And then they have this gas pipeline, Nord Stream 2, which is designed to get Russian gas through the Baltic Sea and into Germany and into Western Europe, which A, makes Germany and Western Europe dependent on Russia, and B, is just uh, morally completely 
wrong. And again, Russian uh, Germans slightly scratch their heads when anybody rails against it. So it's it really is problematic, Germany's approach to to Russia, and it's one of the few areas I would argue they don't do it better. So let's talk about the pandemic. Um, when you wrote this, uh, Germany was in a, a much better position. It's subsequently suffered more heavily with, with second and third waves. Um, even then, it's done much better than the UK in terms of cases and, and deaths. Um, what do you think explains the difference between our outcome here and the German case? It's really difficult writing books about the pandemic or even doing any long form journalism because the issue changes the whole time with new viruses and mutations and stats and approaches. But there is an underlying trend. Uh, and as you say, at the beginning, uh, Boris Johnson absented himself from important meetings, didn't take it seriously. It was all part of this sort of make it up as you go along, cheeky chappy approach to politics. Whereas Merkel and her scientists very quickly, she's a scientist herself. <laughs> all those leaders, by the way, who've had scientific backgrounds have tended to perform better on COVID than others. That's perhaps not surprising. But she took it seriously, the regions took it seriously. There was a fear because Germany is so devolved that it would be hard to corral everybody into a, a single COVID policy. Those fears appeared to be unfounded. Germany's very strong engineering, science base, um, pharmaceutical, biomedicine approach all worked in its favor. Basically, the seriousness of the country as opposed to the flippancy of British politics worked in its favour. Where What's interesting in the last several weeks with the almost the flipping of the argument on immunisation and um, it is fascinating the uh, Brexit crowd arguing that because the UK is now out it could be more fleet of foot as uh, Ursula von der Leyen herself said, it's a speedboat versus a tanker. And in some, and she was trying to say that in a negative way, but actually it has its attractions being a speedboat when you are trying to deal with things. But time will tell on this, but the fact that Britain only a few weeks ago marked 100,000 deaths, the highest per capita death rate anywhere in the world, is an object of extraordinary shame. Um, the fact that some political commentators now talk about Johnson, quote, winning, unquote, because the vaccines just so shows how puerile our political debate is. But Germany does have to ask itself some questions. Question number one is, by handing jurisdiction on this life and death question of vaccines to the EU, did that work? Did it serve its people? And the answer to those two so far has to be absolutely, it didn't. And secondly, why generally was it slow? Um, there is a phrase, langsam aber sicher, slow but sure, or slow but steady, which I use frequently in the book to describe a political culture I think works well. But in certain instances, it doesn't work well. And when you need to respond quickly, that's when it comes a cropper and it clearly has done on this case. But overall, yeah, the German approach to things is, I would much rather fall ill in Germany than I would in Britain, put it that way. So I'm conscious of your time, so I've, I've got two more. Um, okay. They better be quick because I've got to um, be gone by 22. So, so okay. I'll do, I'll do two answers then, or which, either one or two, but I'll be quick. Um, so in the conclusion of the book, you're, you reflect on the future of uh, the CDU leadership um, and you, you mentioned Mers and and, uh, and Lachette of course who, and uh, Lachette has been uh, elected. Um, what direction do you see he, him taking Germany in? Well Armin Lachette has been elected as leader of the party. It still is open whether he will become the candidate for Chancellor. He is the solid continuity candidate 
but he excites very few people, including in his own party. He just got over the line against Merz, who's a pretty controversial figure. So again, it's a sort of, it was a lesser of evils rather than a great vote of confidence. Ma uh, Marcus Zerda, the uh, minister president of Bavaria, sort of semi-autonomous Bavaria, the semi-autonomous CSU affiliated party, will he be the one that is chosen by the CDU and the CSU to lead them into the next election and thereby almost certainly becoming the chancellor? If that's the case, that would be a first, a Bavarian and a member of the sister party. The CSU used to always be regarded as a sort of very right-wing um, party. It's, it's, it isn't that anymore. Um, it's moved on. Uh, so it is it is up for grabs. Soda, in some ways, is the more attractive and the more interesting and different candidate because it's often forgotten that if, had it not been for COVID, there were a lot of people slagging Merkel off. They were mm. saying things have atrophied and time for a change. And there's very little evidence to suggest that Laschet will mark much of a change. Okay, I, I won't keep you any longer. Um, John Campton, thanks very much for your time. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Rob.